this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. The evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force from Dunkirk in 1940 is one of the most iconic moments of the Second World War. The miracle of the little ships plucking soldiers off the beach is regularly played out in popular media, including the 1958 and 2017 films titled Dunkirk. But this is very much the British narrative. What if we turn the tables to look at the fighting from the German perspective? Joining me once more is Robert Kershaw. Robert was last with us to discuss D-Day and the landings at Omaha Beach in episode 92. He has a new book, Dunkirken, 1940, The German View of Dunkirk. Welcome back, Robert. Um, I wonder, um, to explain the fighting around Dunkirk from the German point of view, do we need to start with the uh, a German attack in the West? I mean, what what was the plan? And did Dunkirk fit in that plan when the campaign no. was launched? No. Uh, w- what is interesting is that there was a very creative plan. A lot of people tend to say that Army Group B that came through Belgium was a feint and the real um, strike was the, the panzer thrust through the Ardennes. I don't entirely subscribe to that because if you look at the forces involved, uh, Army Group B is about two thirds the size of A. So you're looking at a parallel offensive. The other point is that the Falschenjäger, which had never been used on a large scale before, are used in Army Group B's sector. So that wasn't as a feint because they were appropriately used there because they were overcoming the Dutch water obstacles. But all that has subsequently, I think, been lost. So I see it as a, as a two-pronged offensive, both in effect covering the other. Now, I think the thing that happened was that it very quickly became a victim of its own success in the sense that Hitler was pursuing this new creative idea. And then suddenly it was working very well indeed. And the senior German generals were very um, risk adverse, thinking constantly all the time that there would be a second Marne, as in the case of the First World War, when they were almost upon Paris. And then there was the French counteroffensive. So the senior German generals were always looking over their shoulder, saying, surely it can't be this easy. The Allies are holding back something. And it's going to surprise us. So as the Germans approach the coast, they're making more progress than they originally envisaged and much faster. And there's a lot of friction between what I would call the tactical command level, which is the division and corps commanders, and the strategic level, the senior commanders, uh, because they, the tactical commanders know that they've got this in the bag whereas the senior command are not certain. And Hitler, in between, actually loses control, if you like, of the momentum of Blitzkrieg. So when this amorphous mass of German units arrives at the coast, there isn't a plan because they got there before they had even a chance to develop a plan. So when they hit the coast, there is a pause. There is both a tactical pause, you get the Panzer Halt order, which is um, really a a consequence of resistance, physical obstacles and German exhaustion. And then you get this philosophical and mental pause where the Germans are saying, we've got to sort this out. The aim was to reach the coast and then turn for Paris. So they're already thinking of the next operation, Operation Rolt, which is wrapping up the rest of France. So they're already pulling units out um, when they arrive on the coast to deal with that. And then eventually, if you think that the Panzer Hort order was on the 24th of May, they're released about the 27th of May. 
the nine days of the Dunkirk evacuation only includes one day of the Panzer Hort order. So you can see the way this is going. The shape of the Allied pocket at that stage, at the time of the Hort order, is shaped like a boot with the heel and sole on the coast and part of it sticking out inland. And then when the Belgians surrender, the Germans then, in a sense, rather lose the plot because there is not a plan ready to exploit that significant um, development, which was not a surprise. I mean, they were anticipating it, but there was no plan. So it's ironic that all that German initiative and, um, if you like, daring on reaching the coast is thrown away when they get there because they use initiative to get to the coast, but on arriving at the coast, they fail to coordinate a plan to take out the pocket. And part of that is because of the complacency about the fact with all the wreckage that you saw from that film on on, on the way um, to the beaches, the average German soldier thought, well, we've got this in the bag. And I rather remember a similar situation like that when I was in the first Gulf War. I was part of the uh, American thrust uh, toward Kuwait City, surrounded by all this wreckage, and everybody knew we had it in the bag. In, in the bag, and so people are, are that much more careful about risking their lives and being daring. Because what's the point if if the war's going to be over in a few days' time, um, and we've all palpably won? Why why take the risk? So you get that sort of inertia. The Germans know they have this in the bag. And they're not concentrating on reducing the pocket. They're looking at the signposts leading toward Paris and the rest of France. And so the whole thing loses momentum. The crisis over the Hort order is really a loss of nerve at the German senior command level. And Hitler actually is losing control of the momentum of this advance because he spends more time putting down his army uh, chief of staff from Brautic, uh, because he overstepped his authority, than dealing with the matter in hand, which is annihilate the opposition. I wonder when you're talking about um, uh, loss of momentum, though, you know, there is a, you know, they push through the Ardennes. This is the, this is the classic Blitzkrieg campaign. You know, as those uh, troops are closing in on the coast, how problematic had been that rapid campaign for the units that 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 were spearheading all this? Well, the the units that get to the coast first are the Panzer units, and they broadly follow the line of the River Somme uh, to the south. The main units that are going to be up against the uh, Dunkirk pocket are really um, the advancing infantry units of Army Group B advancing across Holland and then Belgium into northern France. So there is an entirely different perspective. By then, and many of the um, armoured units are starting to be withdrawn for the next phase of the offensive, and this is slowing the infantry up. And when they actually arrive at that boot-shaped pocket, they run out of room because there's something like... Uh, must have been 30, 35 divisions closing in on the pocket. There's not the room to bring combat power to bear. They're all completely um, falling over themselves. And you've also got to bear in mind that the thrust of the advance of Army Group B is going from uh, east to west, whereas Army Group A, the Panzers, are already at the coast and are looking from south to north. So somehow or other, two different army groups have got to coordinate so they don't fire upon each other as they close in on the pocket. Had that been anticipated that as a as a problem, what, what happens when the two army groups meet? No. There's nothing in place, no higher command structure to organise that? Not, not really, because what happens once you cross the start line, the plan goes for a ball of chalk. That, that's normally the case in war, and that's precisely what happened here. So... They reach the coast unexpectedly quickly, 
And so really, you do need to have a pause and a scheme of operations to deal with this pocket on the coast. Now, bearing in mind all the wreckage and all the rest of it, there was no urgency because they thought, well, they're going to surrender, aren't they? The Belgians did. Um, the Dutch had already surrendered. They're going to surrender. The, the Germans were a land-centric army. They had no concept at all of the power of the Royal Navy and its ability to take that number of men, the seafaring nation is able to take that number of men off those beaches, which is completely unprecedented. I mean, 300,000 guys, I mean, 10,000 guys a day on those beaches. I mean, never happened before. A bit like D-Day in reverse. Nobody thought, you know, they could, they, you could go back the same way. The other thing I was going to ask about, there is this um, British attack at Arras by the armour, and this is often recounted out as being a, 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 a potentially successful, or if not a su successful in, insofar as it rattles the Germans. I mean, how how much of a problem was that attack to the Germans? Did it did it affect their uh, thinking about when when you when you're looking at the halt order, which again. It has been connect. People have connected. I mean, I suspect it's a very British perspective, connecting a British counterattack with the Holt order. Um, is there anything there? Did it did it rattle the Germans? Uh, yes, it did. But you should see it in the context of several other scares before that moment. Um, for example, on when the Germans closed in on the Meurs, the first of the major obstacles for the breakout into France, um, there was a lot of nervousness. And Guderian, who was with the lead Panzer Corps, was asked, uh, was ordered really to pause, but he pushed on. So there was a nervous moment there. And then on the 17th of May, uh, von Kleist, who is in charge of this Panzer thrust, to the south that had come through the Ardennes, goes to forward to meet with Guderian, who keeps making tactical uh, leaps forward, and scolds him for the progress he's made because he's doing it without orders. Guderian threatens to resign on the spot because he was expecting to be receive a pat on the back instead of being scolded, and the whole thing got pushed up to von Brunstedt. So you've got this nervousness um, uh, at, the, at, the, at the higher command level. And then lo and behold, on the 21st of May, you get this counterattack at Arras, which was not that well conducted and was not that powerful, but completely caught one of the panzer divisions in the flank, Rommel's seventh uh, panzer, and gave him a hell of a flight, fright. Rommel reports that he's being attacked by at least a corps. It was only two battalions plus some armour. And this scare confirmed the fears of the higher command and Hitler that they needed to be careful and that the infantry needed to be given a chance to close up. And then the following day, really, or the day after, von Rundstedt orders the panzers to pause in any case so that the infantry can begin to close up. Von Brautich, who is the army chief of command, very unusually steps in and orders that all the armour belonging to von Rundstedt should, be, should come under command of Army Group B, which is closing in on the Dunkirk perimeter. So in terms of reducing that pocket on the coast, that makes enormous sense. But that was done without Hitler's knowledge. Hitler, meanwhile, turns up at von Rundstedt's headquarters to see how it's going. Here's that von Rundstedt has declared a pause and agrees with this because Hitler's getting nervous as well. And then von Rundstedt turns around and very disingenuously informs him that, by the way, the army commander has told me to stop and hand over all my panzer units to Army Group B. And Hitler has a, a complete meltdown over this gives von Brauchic a severe bollocking, which takes away any confidence he might have had, humiliates him, really, in front of the staff. And, and you've got this tension at, 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 at the higher level, which has an impact on the uh, momentum of the advance to the coast.
So Arras is part of a number of scares that had checked the German advance at various stages before then and only seemed to confirm their fears. So a small event with enormous impact at the higher level, virtually nil at the operational level. Obviously, was that pause needed? I mean, I do wonder about they've they've travelled miles, you know, the tails lagging behind the panzers. Presumably they've got logistical issues as well as that struggling to keep up. Was that pause going to be inevitable irrespective? Yeah, I, I suggest in the book that that is in fact the case. And, and, and the reasoning behind that was I got hold of all the post-combat reports of all the divisions and corps that were involved. And I was seeking to identify what the impact of Hitler's Hawk order would be on these units, whether they complained and so on and so forth. And when you go for all the unit counts, there's very little complaint. They all need a hawk. So there's no, oh, my God, you know, Hitler's got this wrong, which the armchair strategists have said since. And this happens after a major armoured advance. You need to pause to refuel, replenish, replan, reorganise. That's the norm. And yet I think the documentary filmmakers and whatever have uh, glossed this up in, 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 into a drama that it wasn't. There's virtually no comment, derogatory comment, apart from officers after the war, when, of course, Hitler had been defeated, had made these mal decisions at Stalingrad and Kursk, and they then say, well, of course, you know, you got it wrong at Dunkirk as well. That, 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 that plays to the British narrative as well, doesn't it? The, um... It does. It does. You see, one of, the, one of the interesting things I found when I was doing the research was that I always feel you need to get to the people who are taking the, the decision and what was influencing them at the time. And all this stuff that has been invented since was not applicable at the time. And so these, these were human, the, the, these were normal human reactions with units at, at war. And the other thing is that eventually there were 10 German divisions working a way to destroy the Dunkirk pocket at the end. All 10 of those divisions were subsequently destroyed in Russia. So people who were fighting um, in the combat arms in 1940 were unlikely still to be alive in 1945 and after the war. And so we're not exactly buried under um, a, a series of personal accounts and memoirs because most of those people perished in Russia. With that, their opinions. And that, then you fall back on all those interviews post-war where they're changing the tune. Yeah, I mean, one of the big problems with the book it was to find personal accounts. Very few people, particularly in the Panzer arm, um, were still alive um, uh, who had fought during the, the fall of France. And there are very few memoirs today uh, dating from that period. You've got Von Luck, Panzer commander. Uh, he made it and was actually part of that offensive. And you get one or two artillery commanders, but that's it. But during that pause, that pause does only refer to the army. So presumably uh, the Luftwaffe and the Kriegsmarine can carry on their offensive. Yes, they can. And, uh, and that is also interesting because... When I looked at the documents, um, the Luftwaffe, the surviving Luftwaffe documents, I thought, wow, you know, Goering uh, makes a big showy decision with Hitler that the Luftwaffe will finish off the pocket. What is interesting is the day after Goering gives this agreement to destroy the pocket, the, the whole tenor of the raids does not suddenly shift onto Dunkirk. They're still flying inland and indeed at against the other ports, Ostend and so on further north. So it takes a while before the order percolates down. And when the order percolates down, you find actually you need different armaments to deal with shipping as distinct from destroying bunkers. You need different sorts of bombs. Also, the uh, German aircraft, by this time, the bombers are tending to fly twin engine all the way from the Reich to get to the coast. The only unit that's moved forward is von Richthofen's 8th Luftwaffe Corps, uh, Flieger Corps, and they are the close 
air support boys and they are in the sort of Amiens area and that is because he needs the Strukas which have which have a shorter range um, and all that takes time so in fact in terms of the Luftwaffe effort if you take the nine days of the evacuation the Luftwaffe are only effective on two and a half days of that because primarily the weather but also all these other what you would call friction of war um, factors logistics the planning involved the coordination involved takes all day for a bomber to fly from germany do the business at dunkirk and go back again there's not time again for another sortie and all that is missed in the blitzkrieg myth almost the invincibility of the german army and the other interesting factor of course which I didn't realise until I got into this original material, is that it wasn't the advent of the Spitfire that changed it all, because, you know, that or every documentary you see about Dunkirk says, you know, well, when the Spitfire turned up, that, that, that changed it all. It was the RAF bombers who were actually suppressing German troop movements near the coast. They particularly hit uh, the guys coming down from Belgium in the Newport area, and many of the headquarters around uh, the fighting for Calais were being bombed on a regular basis by the uh, Royal Air Force. And all that, you know, has, has gone missing in the Hollywood and, and, and other takes on, on the, the air war at that time. You know, the Brill Green boys did all right. But, of course, they were out of sight of the troops on the ground. They're, they're flying at 15,000, 20,000 feet and doing the business up there. Nobody can see anything. And they're doing it inland and out to sea. And, uh, of course, the um, many Luftwaffe raids got through and the troops were underimpressed and, and, and made their feelings known when they got back to the UK, which fits into this heroic myth, if you like, of the, 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 the RAF finally saving the day at the Battle of Britain and, you know, staving off invasion. So, you know, the Brookine boys get a, get, get a makeover. Mm, yes, get a makeover. Oh, how about the Kriegsmarine? From a British perspective, it's a campaign all of its own. From the German perspective, it's, it's not really. It, it's a bigger thing. So are the Kriegsmarine even, I was saying motivated is not the word I was meaning for, are, are they even um, co-opted into the campaign in the channel? Yes. Yes, they are. But um, what you've got to realise is that the uh, German destroyer fleet which is more suited to these sort of operations, pretty well wiped out in the Norwegian campaign. But um, once the ports in um, Holland had been taken, um, e-boats started to come down to the Dunkirk area and sank a number of ships, as indeed some U-boats as well. But the bottom line is both the Luftwaffe and the Kriegsmarine do not make serious indent on the carrying capacity of the shipping that is taking the British Army off. If, if you take the Lancastria, a liner that you know was sunk after Dunkirk, they reckon that between four and 7,000, depending on what you believe, soldiers went down with that, perished. That is one third of the total deaths, fatalities, in the uh, campaign that the BEF conducted in France. So just imagine what they could have done, what their, what, their, what their capabilities might have been if they had concentrated either on putting the port facilities out of action or going for just the big ships. Um, but there was no coherent Luftwaffe plan. It makes you wonder if they really understood what was happening. The reconnaissance reports clearly show, the original Luftwaffe reconnaissance reports clearly show Masses of shipping heading for Dunkirk and or in the Straits of Dover. So there's definitely something going on. They don't really talk about them reinforcing what's going on. And very quickly, they're talking about they're taking eventually. It's very clear to the Germans. Uh, well, 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 early on in the nine day evacuation process, the Germans knew what was going on. But they thought, so what? Um, they're going to surrender when they get back to England anyway. Well, I was going to say, if you're, if from an operational point of view, actually the fall of France is the, is, is the key thing of that operation. Removing 
the British troops from France is actually a, a, a victory condition from from their point of view, isn't it? Yes, I think I think the figures are something like thirty, forty. Uh, Allied divisions knocked out of the uh, order of battle, another 17 badly mauled. So 10 British divisions getting away by sea, small fry. So what? Now, something you brought out in the book, which I hadn't realised, is the, the forces, the Germans don't have that classic three to one advantage when they uh, surround Dunkirk, do they? No, they don't. Um, in fact, at one stage, I think they're, they, they're outnumbered by the people being evacuated. But the, the the thing about Dunkirk, which is not often realised because people talk about the, you know, the, the panzers that are going to come in and take it, and, and they would have done, but for the panzer halt order. The terrain around there, when you when you look at it, is is in no way suited to armour. From whichever direction you come, east, west or south, against the Dunkirk perimeter, you've got to cross five or six canals. So it's it, it, it's sim- it's simply not going to happen. They're not. It it was never a realistic prospect. The only Panzer attack that was conducted against the um, pocket was the first Panzer division that attacked on the twenty fourth of May, which is the day of the halt order, and they were repelled by the French. Well, just think about numbers. Do the Germans do the Germans build up their troops to knock out the pocket? No, their infantry, or is it? No, if you go back to the point I made before, there was never, a, there wasn't a plan. So for several days, units are milling around because what they're doing is they're tending to withdraw the mobile units for Operation Rolt, the second phase, and move up infantry units. So that takes time, and there's not a lot of room either, and so all the roads are congested by. German units withdrawing from that area and others coming up to replace them. Eventually, um, well into the battle, the commander of the 8th Army, von Kuchler, is put in charge of the reduction of the Dunkirk pocket, and he takes command of all the divisions surrounding the pocket. And by this time, he, he was given 10. Of those 10, only five can bring combat power to bear because of the flooding, the deliberate Allied flooding uh, that um, had made much of the perimeter impassable. So it, it was a cake and ass party, really. Well, I was going to say, presumably, as the as the evacuation uh, uh, happens and troops withdrawn, actually works in the Germans' favour when you're looking at figures. They're yeah, more men yeah, yeah. <laughs> by accident rather than through attrition. But uh, I think what, one of the reasons why I was interested in going back to the original documentation was because when I was uh, finishing off my army career, I was um, based at uh, NATO headquarters in Brussels. I was um, running the, I was the executive officer in the Int Division. And we were asked to lay on a battlefield tour that had, that had to be combined arms, Army, Navy, Air. And we were so busy at the time, we couldn't go anywhere. And I said, well, Dunkirk's down the road. We ought to do that. What happened was various people were given various appointments because I speak and read German. I was given the German angle to look at. And I said, look, I can only do this if you get, get me all the original documentation. So all that stuff came in. And then cut a long story short, when I left... Um, we had a crisis uh, uh, in NATO, it was Afghanistan, um, Iraq was going wrong. There were all sorts, of, anyway, the, the exercise got cancelled, but I had all this documentation. And I knew I was going to be a writer when I left anyway, it was my last year, and I thought, well, I then bought in to more, got hired somebody at the uh, uh, Bundesarchive to get me particular stuff that I'd identified. And then I put all that in the attic. And then nine books later, we had this COVID pandemic. I couldn't travel anywhere to research. I thought, well, now's the time to get this stuff down from the attic. So when I got it down, I thought, what is there new to say about Dunkirk? And and what intrigued me was, having spent two years at the German General Staff College, I'm German General Staff trained, I thought, how on earth did they allow them to get away? 
And so that's what was driving the research. What was the key point where differences could have occurred? And I narrowed it down to the end of um, May and the beginning of June, four days. And we already mentioned that the Kriegsmarine and the Luftwaffe made no impact on the uh, carrying capacity of the Allied fleets. So therefore, the only way of stopping this invasion is that you get land forces into the port areas. And the only possibility is coming in after the Belgian surrender. So having identified these four days, I I look very um, closely at that. Uh, because those four days were the days when the key fighting elements of the BEF were taken off. Everything before had been all the odds and sods, logistics, blah, blah, blah. Then the rear guard started to come in and the main fighting force. Now, this is the seed call of the future British Army. These are the guys that have fought for the Empire, blah, blah, blah. These were the cream of the British Army. If the Germans could have got these guys, we would have been in serious trouble. They could have been hostages for negotiations, so on and so forth. So all my research was aimed at why was it and how was it? How did these guys, did these, these formations get away? And it was very, very close. The Germans could have rolled up the sand dune area, Bray dunes, but they were held back by the French as, as the final um, divisions of the British Army got away. So that was it in essence. If the Germans can get those um, fighting divisions, then then they could have conceivably have obliged the Brits to surrender. Yeah, holds up. It it is a very much a Churchillian narrative of the miracle miracle of Dunkirk. He sort of set the seed going. But I'm slightly intrigued by uh, how is it viewed in Germany? Did, I mean, did, 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 uh, is there a changing German view of Dunkirk? Is it even a thing in a German narrative of the war? No. Uh, it's um, a tactical sideshow, a signpost on the way to Paris. Right at the end, right at the end of the campaign. Is it a collapse or is it an organised surrender? How does Dunkirk fall Yeah, um, from the German point of view? That's not been covered before. So that was kind of interesting. So I really had to get down into the detail of that. Esen- essentially, once those um, key British units are taken off, the French fight on for another three days. They cover the British withdrawal and they fight on for another three days. And I describe the German division moves, which are really concentric attacks where they're able to get through the flooded area at at the um, uh, Dunkirk perimeter. And essentially it's the 18th Infantry Division coming in from the south, pushes up with another sister division uh, at making breaches beyond the old medieval town of Berg. And then the key advance, which should have happened earlier, is from the Belgian end, from Newport, along the beaches of Bray Dunes. And the French hold the line there. And the old Franco Belgian border was a fortified one because it wasn't the days of the EU. It was a fortified one. And people tend to forget that. So there were concrete bunkers and all that sort of stuff in place. And the French held the Germans off to the extent that the 56th Division that was coming from that direction had to be withdrawn from the line uh, because it was fought out with casualties. And it was replaced by another division that eventually pushed in. So essentially, you had a thrust line coming up from the south, coincidental with one coming in from the east. And they they meet in the port area in Dunkirk on the 4th, on the morning of the 4th of June. The last uh, British troops had had left on the 1st. It's funny because often you know the 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 the, the, the narrative ends with the uh, you know the the British is it Alexander going up and down the beach asking if there's anybody there. No, they Uh, fight on the French. They fight on. And interestingly enough, it is the French that fight the two major if you like, envelopment threats to the British Expeditionary Force to a standstill. First of all, in the West, when they repelled the um, uh, Guderian's Corps 1st Panzer Division attack, that was the French 68th Division. And then the 12th holds the line of the old frontier 
and keeps the Germans away from the beaches at Bray Dunes. And the Germans get close enough looking at the original records and they can see the shipping and they're shelling it. I wonder if, uh, I can't remember the, the Dunkirk, John Mills Dunkirk film. Did the French appear in it? No. <clears throat> no, I didn't, re- couldn't remember them. It's a, bit, it's a bit like Saving Private Ryan. We don't appear in that. Do yeah, we? yeah, yeah. So as early as the 50s, uh, I presume that's a 50s film, we're, we're writing, it might even be early, we're, we're writing the French out of uh, the Dunkirk narrative and it's all us. I think we still are a bit. You don't you don't see that you don't see French resistance mentioned uh, in many accounts. And the other interesting thing was I, I looked at the German appreciation of the enemy, which was the Belgians, the Dutch, the British, whatever, and they had a grudging respect for the Belgians. The Belgians actually performed quite well. I mean, we always say, "Ah, oh, the Belgians stabbed us in the back and all the rest of it." The Belgians had to retreat because the French front to their right had collapsed in the same way that the British had to repeat, retreat. But we're not blamed for that, but the Belgians are. And the Belgians are fighting for their own country and they impose very heavy casualties on a number of the German infantry units that eventually close in on the Dunkirk perimeter. So they're pretty exhausted and weakened by the time they get there. So the Belgians had a substantial impact on the German advance. Yeah, well, that- Again, could back to the from the British perspective. Once Dunkirk's over, that, that's that, that's France fallen. Yeah, I, I mean, you've got the Allenbrook memoirs and all the rest of it saying bloody Belgians, you know, let them down again. But actually, when the Belgians surrendered, that that created an enormous military vacuum in that part of um, northern France, and the Germans were unable to fill it primarily because of milling thousands of milling Belgian troops and also refugees and they couldn't move through and the Belgians didn't exactly leap to attention to get out of the way I mean they they moved at their own pace and interesting enough they handed over where they could their vehicles to the French army before the Germans could get them with 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 the with the BEF evacuated um we should perhaps leave the Germans to occupy Dunkirk thanks Robert Loyal listener, Robert's book is Dunkirk in 1940, The German View of Dunkirk. I will put a link on the website. Don't forget, if you have enjoyed the podcast, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash WW2podcast. A dollar or so from you each month helps me to find the time to put the show together. And I thank those who already support the show. So that's patreon.com slash WW2podcast. Next time out, I'll be talking to Ben McIntyre about Colditz. So until then, I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening. Jerry, 88mm gun hit our tank, blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. The hell out of it. Stalingrad can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice.